I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you guys about this liberty over security thing. Uh, and how many of you learned a lot yesterday? Amen. Right? How many of you realize now that British history is very, very important to understanding the foundation of America? How many of you also understand now that history is not just a bunch of boring memorizations of dates and dead people? It's an exciting thing. It's something that we need to learn from. And this is something that our founders wanted us to learn from as well. We hear this in modern day concept, liberty over security. We hear it in the, in the, in the delivery of, we need to have a balance. How many of you heard that? We need to balance our security needs with the rights of the people. How many of you heard that? The problem is what they're really saying to you is this. We need to increase government power and decrease your rights so that we can say to you, you can feel safe. Because here's the trick. Security is a phantom. You will never feel safe. Because there is always a bigger boogeyman around the corner. I mean, think about this, because what we got going on here is we in America saw something that we hadn't seen for hundreds of years in 2001. We saw the towers fall, right? And on the premise that we need to feel safe, we allowed the government to do great damage to our liberty. And I'll just mention to you from the get-go that this is not a Republican versus Democrat, liberal versus conservative issue. Because it was George W. Bush who brought some of the greatest threats to our liberty that we experience today. It was the conservatives in 2001 who were screaming for government power to make us feel safe. Because we saw the towers fell and we said, hey, wait a minute now. That's scary. We don't want to see that again. So do whatever you have to do to keep us safe. And from that, we got the Patriot Act. We got the indefinite detention provisions within the NDAA of 2012 that still continue today in which the government professes that they have the authority to indefinitely detain any American anywhere on the planet, including here on our soil, with no due process whatsoever, indefinitely. And we got that because we got scared. And we said we want to be safe. But I need to ask you a question. Looking at the world today, given the fact that we traded so much liberty for increased power in government to keep us safe, how many of you think we feel safer today? I think that the fear of threat on American soil has increased incredibly since 2001. I mean, it must have because we have the Department of Homeland Security ramping up their forces. We have our local police departments, our local sheriff's agencies dressed in combat gear, driving around in combat vehicles, looking like they're marching down the streets of Baghdad, right here on our soil talking about the war on this and the war on that, right here in America. So remember, when they say we have to balance your security and your liberty, what they're really saying is, we want you to give us permission to increase our power over you 
to diminish the liberty that you are guaranteed, not simply by constitution, but by natural right. Anytime anybody in power talks about a balance, they're not really talking about balance. They're talking about an increase of power. And there is a direct correlation between power of government and liberty. Every time the government increases power, the liberty of the people decreases. There is no trade. Benjamin Franklin is, is, is attributed with saying anyone who would trade a temporary security. Why is it temporary? Because you will never feel safe. Anybody who would trade a temporary security for liberty will soon have neither. Why? Because security is a phantom and there's not a balance. Remember, history is our greatest teacher. How many of you heard of Patrick Henry? All right, tell me the famous line from Patrick Henry's famous speech. Give me liberty or give me death. Remember, you guys don't have to raise your hand with me. I want you to shout it out. We're just, we're just here together having a conversation, okay? So how does that go? What is that line? Give me liberty or give me death. How many of you have read this whole speech? Oops. Okay, he says a whole lot more than give me liberty or give me death, okay? So here's part of your homework from this week. You've got to go online and read the whole speech because he says a whole lot more than that. A whole lot more that's even relevant to us today. As a matter of fact, this is something that he says. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided and that is the lamp of experience. I know no way to judge the future but by the past. How many of you would like to know the future? How many of you would like to predict the future? Wouldn't that be kind of cool? Well, you can. All you have to do is study history, right? Why? Because we learned last night, what? That human nature never changes. And history always repeats. For me, as an historian and a studier of human nature, sometimes it's actually a little bit scary to know that much future. Because I know that much past. And I watch us repeating the same mistakes over and over again because we do not know this lesson. So as we discuss this liberty versus security thing, obviously, because I'm here, what are we going to do? We're going to study some history, right? So remember, who lived in the American colonies prior to our independence? What, what nationality of people? British, right? British people. So that means this history that we're studying is a British history and we begin in 17, or I'm sorry, in 1660 with the French and Indian War. Now the French and Indian War threw Great Britain into a great debt. They increased their national debt. They doubled their national debt just simply defending the colonies in the French and Indian War. And this led them to the conclusion that they must quickly pay back this debt, otherwise the country would be in jeopardy. The kingdom would be in jeopardy because when you are in great debt, that gives other countries, other nations, a power over you. If you are in great debt, how do you raise funds to defend yourself? If you are in great debt, who are you in debt to? You are in debt to other nations, which gives them a power over you. And so they came to the people and they said, look, we're going to have to incorporate some emergency temporary taxations because this increase in national debt is creating a national security crisis. Sound familiar? Why? Because history always repeats, right? So what they do is they start passing a series of legislative acts 
to reduce this national debt. One of the first legislative acts is called the Navigation Act of 1660. And what this act does is it mandates that the American colonists purchase items only from government approved merchants. So it makes it against the law to purchase linen, lumber, sugar, tea, paper, and ink, or anything at all from any vendor, any merchant, that is not licensed and approved by the British government, which just happens to be only British merchants. So they outlaw this foreign commerce. And they make it illegal for the American colonists to possess any items that are not on the government mandated list. The next thing they start to do is impose consumption taxes. Who can tell me what a consumption tax is? <laughs> Shh. Yeah. Only the students. Do you guys know what a consumption tax is? Go ahead and repeat it. They already told you. A consumption tax is a sales tax, right? You buy it, then you pay it. You consume it, you pay the tax. They issue consumption taxes not on everything and not equally, but on the things that the American colonists have to have to survive. Linen, lumber, sugar, tea, paper, and ink. Now, how many of you heard of the Boston Tea Party? Here's a little bonus for your educational dollar this morning. The Boston Tea Party was not about a tax on tea. They did not throw the tea in the harbor because they were mad because there was a tax on tea. As a matter of fact, by the time we get to the Boston Tea Party, that particular tax had been cut to less than 1.5%. So knowing that, that they have now incorporated, along with this Navigation Act, a consumption tax on linen, lumber, sugar, tea, paper, and ink. What do you think was the most offensive taxation in the, in the eyes of our American colonists? And it wasn't tea. Say that again louder. Later. What was it? Paper. paper. Not just paper, but paper and ink. Why? Because the paper is no good if you don't have ink on it, right? But guess what? This wasn't a First Amendment freedom of speech or press issue. It was a due process issue. American colonists, British subjects, had a right to due process. Not a privilege, but a right. And Samuel Adams said that if we have to pay the government for paper and ink, that eliminates our right to due process. Why? Because whenever you're engaged in the courts, you have to file documents, don't you? You have to file paperwork. You have to file responses. You have to file legal cases. And in order to file those cases, what do you have to have? Come on, guys. Paper and ink. He says, by the fact that we have to pay for our paper and ink, which takes away our right to due process, because if we have to pay the government for what we need to engage in due process, due process is no longer a right, it's a privilege. Does that make sense? Samuel Adams said, what would, what would it take then for the government to make this tax on paper and ink so high that we could no longer participate in our right to due process? We should think about these things as we move through our daily lives and judge where we are in this balance of liberty and security. Now remember, we have a tax on linen, lumber, sugar, tea, paper, and ink. Not only that, the only linen, lumber, sugar, tea, paper, and ink is the, is the, that you can purchase is the ones that come from the English merchants approved by the British government. So we have mandated purchases. We have legislation now as well without representation. You see, the American colonists were refused their right to legislation through representation because the British government was not allowing 
the American colonists to elect representatives to Parliament. Now, Parliament had some really great excuses. They said, well, you know, you're so far away, you're a whole ocean away, and it would take so long for your elected representative to get here that it would just delay government unreasonably. Not only that, what if your representative died on the way? How many of you know that trip was long and dangerous and lots of people died? So now your representative died along the way. Now we got to start all over again. We got to have an election and we got to send them over there. What if they die when they're over here? It's just way too inconvenient for us to have this. But by the way, you don't have to worry, American colonists, because guess what? We have people in Parliament who have volunteered to represent your interests. How many of you think that's going to work out well? Anybody know what the problem with that is when somebody picks a representative for you? Those, right, those people don't represent you anymore, do they? They represent the people who picked them. They represent their own interests and their own gains. So the colonists were not accepting this either. So now our American colonists are beginning to push back. Push against the mandated purchases, these denials of their right to due process, these taxations without, uh, without proper representation. And in this now, you get to, we get to meet one of my favorite founders of America. His name is James Otis Jr. James Otis Jr. was born February 5th, 1725 in Barnstable, Mass. Did I say that right, my Mass people? I got connected, I, I got corrected when I, when I said Worcester. Okay, so I know it's Worcester. Okay, I know that now. So if, if it's not Barnstable, let me know. I'm sure there's a few vowels we can drop off as long as, a, as well as a few consonants. And just teasing. <laughs> Now, James Otis Jr. Was the, uh, was the son of an attorney. He had two brothers and sisters who were also very important in our battle for independence and the formation of America. James Otis Jr.'s sister, Mercy Otis Warren, is my favorite founding mother. How many of you heard of J Mercy Otis Warren before? You know, that's really kind of crazy to me. You know why? Because Mercy was the first American woman playwright. She was not just simply writing plays. They were published and performed. She is the first American woman historian. She wrote a three-volume set on, called The Rise, Progress, and Termination of the American Revolution. She said, I lived this history. I have to tell it. Not only that, Mercy Otis Warren was a trusted and valued advisor to George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Elbridge Gerry. He, she was a trusted and sought after advisor to presidents and generals. In a day in America when we're supposed to be talking about the, the strong victories of women in our history, why wouldn't we know about Mercy Otis Warren? The first of first American women. Probably one of the most powerful, prominent, and valuable women in our American history. I'll ask you the question that I asked you last night. Who do you think benefits from you not knowing about Mercy Otis Warren. Their brother, Joseph Warren, was a general and he had a reputation for having a very quick, fiery temper. He seemed to be quite the adrenaline junkie, I think. And this is James Otis Jr.'s family. Now he was raised by an attorney to be an attorney. Which means he not only was raised in British law, he was raised in those Liberty Charters. You remember the Liberty Charters we talked about yet last night? Remember the 1100 Charter of Liberties? The Magna Carta? The Petition of Right of 1628? The Grand Remonstrance of 1641? 
and the English Bill of Rights of 1689. He knew that there were guaranteed liberties for all Englishmen. And he knew those liberties did not come from documents. They came from God as a natural right. Now the American colonists are pushing back against these mandated purchases by government, this taxation without representation, legislation without representation, this denial of due process. So we still have the government and those who are loyal to the crown screaming, we've got to pay off this debt. It's creating a national security crisis, but we have people who are refusing to pay. There's a black market that's growing. Buy the stuff that's not on the list. But what good is a tax if you can't collect it, right? So Parliament, in response, passes a law called Writs of Assistance. Now these Writs of Assistance are what we would call today a handwritten warrant. Warrants in the hands of individual customs agents, tax collectors, to search and seize the property of the American colonists once again, without due process. We're talking individual arbitrary power in the hands of the agents. Now this was not just simply good people executing law for the collection of taxes. What is the limit of someone's power if there is no check on their power? Is there a limit at all? And what keeps bad people from using that power for their own gain? You see, Englishmen were guaranteed the right to due process. And even from the Magna Carta were guaranteed the right to reasonable searches and seizures. These writs of assistance completely annihilated that. And here's the crazy thing. We have British citizens saying this is okay because after all the government's just simply trying to enforce the law. It's the law after all. What's the problem? Well, James Otis Jr. is going to teach us that problem. James Otis Jr. will engage in a legal battle. You see, James Otis Jr was given the highest post that any person, any attorney could achieve in the American colonies by the king. It was his job not only to enforce the laws of the crown, but to make sure that the people who violate those laws were properly prosecuted. But remember, Otis is trained in law and he's trained in liberty. And he knows these writs of assistance are a violation of both law and the liberties of the people. So you know what he does? He quits his job. He resigns his post. Now Otis could have gone on to a quiet practice of law, but that's not who he was as a person. That was not how he was raised. And he started taking a public stand against these writs of assistance. He was publishing pamphlets, writing letters. He was teaching anybody he could teach about how these writs of assistance were a violation of the rights and the liberties of the people. Let's pause and look at this in its context for just a second. James Otis Jr., a former government employee Outraged by what he saw the government doing in violation of the people's rights to privacy and property. Quit his job and became a whistleblower to expose the government's violation of our rights to privacy and property. Would anybody know anybody in America who has done something like that recently? Do you know his name? Students. Yeah, go ahead. Edward Snowden. See, we have great controversy today over Edward Snowden. There are people who don't like Edward Snowden. 
but it's because they don't understand the value of what he did. Edward Snowden is not an enemy to America. Edward Snowden fought to expose the violations of your liberties. Think about where we would be today if Edward Snowden had not exposed what our federal government was doing. Reading our emails, listening to our phone conversations, taking pictures of us as we drive down the roads. If people want to be angry about what Edward Snowden exposed, they need to be angry at the federal government for collecting that stuff when they didn't have the authority to do it in the first place, not at the man who exposed it. <laughs> Let me mention to you, the Washington Post a couple of years ago did a Freedom of Information Act request from the Department of Justice and the FBI. And they found out by their own federal documents that the federal government, you know those red light cameras that you see? How many of you see the cameras on the roads and on the stoplights and all that stuff? Okay, those cameras, the federal government says, are taking pictures of you. They're taking pictures of you driving or whoever's driving the car. They're taking pictures of whoever the passengers are in the car. They're taking pictures of your license plates as you drive by. They're sending them all to the federal government because the federal government is storing up this information by their own admission for future reference and use. They're not there to see whether you're going to violate a traffic law. They are there so the government can spy on who you're with and where you're going. And these documents admit that they have been doing this since 2008. Since 2008, the government has been taking pictures of you and storing them up for future use. Who benefits from that? Not you. There was no warrant. Your due process rights are not being respected. If you had told your neighbors in 2008 that those red light cameras were taking pictures of you so the federal government could spy on where you go and who you're with in 2008, if you told your neighbor that in 2008, what would they say to you? Crazy. You're crazy, right? But now you need to ask another question. Are you paying attention? I know we're almost ready for lunch. But if the government has been spying on you and tracking who you're with and where you're going since 2008, and they're just now admitting it, what are they doing now that they're not admitting to? See, these are the things that we need to think about. And these are the things that James Otis Jr. said in his day. You see, these warrantless searches were not conducted by all moral men. They were not just simply searching and seizing for linen, lumber, sugar, tea, paper, and ink. They were searching and seizing for whatever they wanted. Look at what he says. What scene does this open? Every man prompted by revenge, ill humor, or wantonness, greed, to inspect the inside of his neighbor's house may get a writ of assistance. Others will ask it from self-defense. One arbitrary exertion will provoke another until society be involved in tumult and in blood. What's to limit a man who has no limit to come and take your stuff just because he wants it? And that's exactly what they were seeing. Two businessmen would come to Otis and say, we can't do this anymore because these agents were stripping them of everything, their, all their possessions, their livelihoods. Two businessmen were, were going bankrupt. They said, if we don't stop this agent, our families will lose everything. Mr. Otis, you're the only one taking a stand. Now let me remind you, this is February of 1761. How many of you heard of the Sons of Liberty? They don't exist yet. Anybody heard of the Committees of Correspondence? They don't exist yet. Otis is the only voice being opposed even by his neighbors. 
They chastise him. They outcast him. They call him everything but a good Christian man. They threaten his livelihood. You will never practice law again. They accuse him of criminal activity. Mr. Otis, why are you opposed to these searches? I mean, only somebody who's breaking the law would be opposed. Only somebody who has something to hide would be opposed. That tells us you must be a lawbreaker. Otis said, I don't have anything to hide, but I have everything to preserve. He would take up this legal case. He would argue in the old state house in Boston. It's still standing there for five solid hours. He calls these writs of assistance the worst instruments of arbitrary power, the most destructive of English liberty and fundamental principles of law that was ever found in an English law book. Do anybody remember from yesterday? I told you where our fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth amendments come from. Do you remember? Where? Well, that's our Bill of Rights. Where do they come from in history? Remember, I called you 30, clauses 38 through 40 in the Magna Carta. Here's clause 39. No freeman shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed or exiled or deprived of his standing in any way, nor will we proceed with force against him or send others to do so except by lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land. They had a right to reasonable searches and seizures. This was a violation. Do you know what's interesting? The moment Otis filed this legal case, the British government conveniently forgot that he resigned his original post and accused him of abandoning his post, which was treason, which means that Otis could be shot on sight. He talks about this as he argues this case for five solid hours. He says, I renounce that office and I argue this case from the same principle. I argue it with greater pleasure as it is in favor of British what? Say it louder. Let's say it together. Ready? He didn't say in favor of British security, did he? Did Patrick Henry say, give me security or give me death? He said, give me liberty. Now these were violent searches and seizures. And James Otis Jr. said that a search outside the rules and laws of nature would totally annihilate your liberty. I want you to keep that in mind, because remember, we're talking about what's happening today. These Patriot Act searches, they're called national security letters, they're called suspicious activity reports. They do not comply with our Fourth Amendment which reads, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. No warrant shall issue, but based upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, particularly describing the place to search or the persons or things to be seized. One of the first requirements of our Fourth Amendment is that every warrant be based upon probable cause. The National Security Letters and the Patriot Act says, no, we don't have to do that anymore. We just need suspicion. That's it. Our Congress changing their power and destroying our liberty. Now Otis would argue for five solid hours and the court, as we said last night, have taken the things, would take the case under advisement. They wouldn't even give an opinion either way. You see, if they found in favor of Otis, they knew they would have the crown on their head. But if they found in favor of the crown, 
a large crowd had gathered in that state house that day. They would have been strung up in the streets. So here's the bad news of it. Otis has sacrificed his reputation. He has sacrificed his employment. He has sacrificed his life. Remember, he's charged with treason. They can kill him anytime they see him. And nothing in the law has changed. Now we could look at that and think, wow, that really stinks. Why are you telling us that awful story, Chrisanne? Because I want you to see that sometimes victories don't look like victories in the beginning. You see, even though it looks like Otis lost that day, in that courtroom that day was John Adams. Samuel Adams, Dr. Warren, and the men who would become our liberty movement. Pat, uh, John Adams actually found this day so important that he would write about it 40 years later. He says, but Otis was a flame of fire with a promptitude of classical illusions, a depth of research, a rapid summary of historical events and dates, a profusion of legal authorities, a prophetic glare of his eye into the future, and a rapid torrent of impetuous eloquence. He hurried away all before him. American independence was then and there born. The seeds of patriots and heroes to defend the vigorous youth were then and there sown. Every man of an immense crowded audience appeared to me to go away as I did, John Adams said, ready to take up arms against writs of assistance. Adams says then and there, February of 1761, was the first scene of the first act of opposition to the arbitrary claims of Great Britain. Then and there, the child of independence was born. Adams concludes by saying, namely, in, he, he says, in 15 years, namely in 1776, that child grew up to manhood and declared himself free. Because of James Otis Jr., we have independence and liberty today. One man took a stand and it inspired a nation and changed the world. If you wonder what you can do as one person, I want you to remember James Otis Jr. Remember the opposition that he was up against. Remember the criticism and the attacks that he suffered. But remember the victory that you have because of what he did. I want you to see this. He says, I can sincerely declare that I cheerfully submit myself to every odious name for conscience sake. And from my soul, I despise all those whose guilt, malice, or folly have made them my foes. Let consequences be what they will. I am determined to proceed. That is the definition of sacred honor. And that's what the people you elect to office ought to sound like. They ought not worry about re-election. They ought not worry about political points. They ought not worry about funding. If they are not worried about your liberty first, then they are not fit for office. We have had too many people We have too many people in office, local, state, and federal level, who believe that it's more important to compromise your liberty for their political positioning than it is to fulfill their oath and their duty to secure your rights. And frankly, that's not their fault because they're quite open about what they are and who they are. The fault rests on we the people who continue to elect and re-elect these people who are only interested in their own self-interests. From James Otis Jr., we not only get the understanding of why we must have a Second Amendment, but we have our Fourth Amendment which declares quite 
literally and exactly the limit of federal power to search and seize your property. There is only one exception to your right to privacy and property, and that one exception is listed here, and it takes five things to fulfill that one exception. A warrant based upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, particularly describing the places to be searched and particularly describing the, per the, the persons or things to be seized. You see that little word and there is very important because it means all five must be present at the same time to be a legal search and seizure. You can't have three out of five, four and a half out of five. You can't even have four and a half out of five. All five must be there. Any deviation from this and you have an illegal search and seizure no matter what the law says. Look what James Madison says. This is not a just government, nor is property secure under it, which a man has in his personal safety or personal liberty is violated by arbitrary seizures of one class of citizens for the service of the rest. Your federal warrants done by FISA courts and secret courts and done by the Department of Justice, done by the FBI, done by the Department of Homeland Security are all violations, complete violations of your right to privacy and property as declared in the Constitution and the Fourth Amendment. And James Madison says that describes our government as being the most complete despotism. This stuff is important. It's not just boring news. It's about who you are. Now James Otis Jr. would be attacked by mercenaries sent by the British government to assassinate him. Coming, he's coming out of a restaurant one night and they beat him and, and they, they cut him with a sword and they beat him over the head with a cane. They do not kill him that day. But they brain damaged him to such an extent that he was never right. They said he went mad. As a matter of fact, there's a story that they had to take care of him 24-7 and one time he escaped the house that he was staying in and went out and fought in the Battle of Bunker Hill and lived. See, you can't quench the spirit of liberty, even with madness. James Otis Jr. said that with all the powers and faculties God has given me, that he would oppose to his dying day all such instruments of slavery on the one hand and villainy on the other as this writs of assistance. I want you to hear those words because he's talking about what our federal government is doing today We're through the Patriot Act, through indefinite detention, through these warrants that are actually granted outside the Constitution. He is describing them as slavery and villainy. Why? Because when you do not even have a security in your own privacy, in your own property, you are not free. James Otis Jr. would die May 23rd, 1783. He is buried at the old Granbury Burial Ground in Boston. And he had a most amazing death. Remember I told you Mercy Otis Warren, his sister, wrote a history book. She writes about his death. You need to read that book, by the way, because there are historians and professors today that want you to believe that Otis was inconsequential that he played no role in who we are today, that it was really an unimportant event. <laughs> but Mercy writes about Otis's death. You know how Otis died? He was walking out of a restaurant one day when a storm erupted and he was struck dead from a crowd of people by a bolt of lightning. Wow. There's a poem in Mercy's book written by a friend of theirs, and I don't have it memorized, 
But it says that God so loved his son Otis, so honored by the stand that he took for God's gift of liberty, that the only appropriate way God could take him home was through a flash of glorious light. Uh -huh. Glorious light. Let me ask you something. Who benefits from you not knowing this history? And how different would America be today if we were teaching this history every single day? This is who you are. I want, I, let me just repeat that. This is who you are. This spirit of liberty courses through your veins. And I believe that you feel it, although sometimes you may not recognize it. You feel it because you are here. Your parents feel it because you are here. And we just need to equip you with the knowledge that will inspire you to defend the liberty worthy of those who came before us. Because this is our battle now. This is our legacy. How many of you will never forget James Otis Jr. again? God bless you guys. Thank you.